Thank you all very much. Welcome. Congratulations to all of you. We're so proud and happy to have you here in the House of Swing. I know you all have worked very, very hard. And uh, we want to do all that we can to help you to maximize this weekend. When you see any of us approach us, you have questions you want to ask us, um, we're here to be a resource for you and to help strengthen whatever it is that you are trying to do. Also, I'd like to encourage you to meet your fellow students. Get with people. You're going to know some people you meet here for the rest of your lives. One of the greatest things about bringing in gatherings of people who are not normally with each other together for a uh, valuable purpose, like playing the great music of, of Ellington and other music that we're playing, is you get a chance to see what other people are doing, to talk with them and to know them and learn about them and, and discover things. Many times the source of greatest education will come from your fellow students. We're gonna, we have a, this open rehearsal we play, but mainly we want to answer your questions and we wanna make sure that we address things you want to have addressed. Uh, Chris is going to tell us which songs and wh which order or what it is that we're going to do. And uh, we'll get to some songs. But I, normally the question period lasts for so long, we end up playing, and then there are a lot of questions. So I think I'd like for us to start with the questions this year. Uh, questions you have about music, about rehearsing, playing an instrument. And address it to any one of us. It doesn't have to be uh, addressed to me. We have a lot of, lot of, there's a lot of information up here on the bandstand. So who's going to be the first person to be brave enough to, come on. Come on, I'm proud of you. You get the microphones right there. Hello? Okay. Hello? <laughs> In my experience, I've seen a lot of people who try and play for themselves and to impress others. How does one play music to truly tell a story that people are captivated and moved by? Okay, that's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It also has two parts. Okay, the first part is how do you tell a story? Tell stories. That's the best way to tell a story? Tell stories. And music, uh, the way that you tell stories is you play phrases and things that are coherent. So that means that as you, I think a good solo to learn is Charlie Parker's solo on Embraceable You. Just how it, I'll take you to a, a thing that Bix Beiderbeck said he noticed when he heard Louis Armstrong play. They were both very young, bless you. They are both very young, early 20s, and he said he noticed as a guy from New Orleans and he liked the way he played because he, he played like phrases. So when he was improvising, it wasn't just licks. There were phrases that one thing led to the next thing led to the other thing. So that's the first rung of it. Try to, try to develop a, a coherent sense of improvisation. Now another thing that's very important for all of you is that you have to have some type of melodic base for your music. I've, I've been saying for quite some time, though there's great resistance to it, learn our folk music. It's a, it's a, there's a system in the folk music of using the sixth and the pentatonic scale and a way of constructing melodies. Do, do, you take a song like Amazing Grace. Do, do, dee, dee, do, dee, 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 dee. Do, do, dee, 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 dee. You take that sound. Do, 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 dee, 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 dee. Do, 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 be, dee, 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 do, do, dee. Next thing you play a little, fill it in. Do, 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 dee, 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 da, bo, bo. Next thing you feel more. See, it comes from that same kind of melodic bass. Learn either either figure out how to play in church, play hymns, play some some form of gospel music. You can play Anglo or Afro-American hymns. Ultimately, you want to be an amalgam of both. Um, the American popular song is an important body of music, but it will only take you so far. Go to the bass and, of course, the blues, different types of regional blues. If you don't know any of this soil material, then it's much difficult for you to connect with an audience unless you're making a commercial product. Mm. 
If you're a commercial product, you can connect with the audience in the language of commercial products. So many times, that's the decision we end up making. It's going to be much easier. If you want to connect with people through what we all have in common, and it's not a commercial product, that's more difficult. And um, those are the things I, I suggest. I, I don't know if somebody else wants to answer the question differently from the way. No? I'm answering it. Thank you. Does, but did that make sense? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And, and also be clear with your objectives. If you want to communicate with me, an important thing is what you're playing has to have something to do with me. I'm going to give you a hint about commercial products. Many times they're designed for a specific group. So a commercial product many times is targeted towards a person of a certain age, a person of a certain gender, a person of a certain race. It's a product. If you try to make a human statement, it's, it's, you're trying to address human beings. You have to have a very broad uh, palette of interest to interest just general human beings. It's once again much easier to address some narrow group of people. So I always recommend for you all to be as broad as you can in your, in your likes and the people you know and the people you encounter and what your aspirations are for yourselves and for our country. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. I like that I, hat. That's a nice I, hat, man. Yeah, yeah. You playing it. That's a rich, very original. I, I understand that consistency is an important part of being a musician and inconsistency is also important. Whenever you walk onto a stage, what, what is the most important thing that you try to do each time you, do, you get onto that stage? <laughs> First of all, that's a great observation. And you're right, both of those things are important. It's important to be consistent and it's important to be inconsistent. Because if you're too routine and you just do the same thing every time, you're just like a computer that you turn on. If you're too inconsistent, you're giving us a little too much to love. <laughs> it's, something that, it's something that our great drummer, Herlin Riley, used to always say, he'd bring in a complete package, what you love and what you hate. Okay, so for me, um, I try to just sound good. I don't have a lot of routines. I, th I think, who would, who would like to answer the question about what you do to be consistent or inconsistent? Patrick? Didn't know there was a mic. Yeah, I guess for me, um, what instrument do you play? I play the bass. Play the bass? Yeah. Oh, well. They <laughs> 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 well then. <laughs> He's like, how you from? Okay. <laughs> well, then what I'm about to say, and also what, you know, what Winton said is also means even more to you. But for me, in terms of inconsistent, inconsistent things, I think one of the things that has a victim to that the most is tone quality. And so if I'm, the first thing I do when I pull out my horn, if I'm getting up to take a solo, anything, if I'm in a practice room, the first thing I do is this. I want to make sure that that first note that comes out is the best note that I can get out. So no matter what else happens, I might not play the best stuff. Or, you know, my ideas might be all over the place, or I might be thinking too much, whatever. That, that's the inconsistent thing that I know I'm going to have to deal with. That's just I have to accept. But one thing I don't want to accept is that I sound bad, <laughs> as, as you know, from my tone perspective. So for me, always what I want to do is make sure that that tone, no matter what I play, people recognize and hear that sound that's coming out of my instrument first and always. So I don't know. That's just me. Great. That's good. It's, it's yeah, and, and I, one, a, a thing I want to add for you is that you already understand things that many don't understand. What I love about your question is you understand the importance of not being polarized. Both things can serve you well. To get better, you have to have a routine. See? That's what they're saying. Check, check. That's right. right. You have to have a routine. The second part is if you... You have to always find a balance. And for each of us, it's different. A person cannot really tell you or give you advice that will be perfect. You have to use whatever you hear and use your own sense of understanding and judgment of what you need to achieve the ends that you want to achieve. Now, in terms of performing, the more prepared you are, if you get nervous, the better you're going to be. Generally, when people come under pressure, whatever their muscle memory is, that's what they're going to go to. So if you're a person who just kind of if you have that attitude the whole time and you don't feel pressured, great. But if you're like this, but you're really not, but inside you're like, be prepared. Okay? 
Okay. Keep wearing those good hats. Yes, sir. Uh, this question is directed to everyone, but how did you go about developing your unique sound amidst a group of people playing a certain way? Who wants to answer? How do you go about developing your unique sound amidst a group of people playing a certain way? A group of everybody's playing the same way and you don't want to sound like them. Is that what? Yes. Well, I think, um, first of all, you have to be aware of all the sounds that are out there, you know, on, on your instrument and not on your instrument and in the world. You have to be aware of, of just the options that are out there. You know, when you're young, I think it's important that you have an idol, musical idol, someone that you imitate, someone that you're going for, that you're, that you're trying to take things from that can ultimately become a part of what that sound is that you're talking about. And you know, they say steal from the best if you're gonna steal at all. So, you know, pick the people doing whatever that is on the highest level and find things that are, that are desirable. And then sometimes you have to also identify the things that you do that might be personal to you. You know, for, for me, I used to tape myself practicing a lot. I used to put on a tape recorder and just tape myself practicing, playing whatever I was gonna be playing that day running through courses of standards or that kind of thing, just me, a cappella, just trombone. And I would just listen, and I would listen back to them and try to find things that gave me problems and also find things that sounded like something I didn't hear on a record somewhere or wasn't a lick that I'd heard from something else and trying to find I, little nuggets that might be personal to me and then take those things outside of it and, I, and develop them and try to find things, find ways to develop them into ideas or sounds that might be personal to the way that I like to play and then try to reinsert them back into playing that tune or whatever the situation might have been. So I think it's important to, to, you know, a combination of those kind of things could help. Is one, one, knowing a lot of sounds, listening to a lot of people play, checking out a lot of people, and then also knowing yourself and finding and identifying the things that are of your own personal output. I think Vic, you also have to Vic, become... Vic, hey, hold on one second. I don't want to cut you off. Just one thing I want to point I want to make. I want to connect that to the first point. I want you to notice he gave you two pieces of advice that seemed like they could be opposites. He told you check out other people, then check yourself out. Okay, you're going to notice a lot of times the best things are about how you ride that wave of the polarity. Don't be on one side or the other, basically. So. Well, in, in, in connection with Winters, too, realize that opposites attract. He always says that the things that are closest are the things that are farthest apart the major seventh and the minor second in a musical context. He said that for years. I think about sound, though, you have to become comfortable with your own voice because the most original voice for you is your voice. The best copy of anything will never be you. And you can always identify your own voice. I bet if your mother was in a room and everybody was talking and she yelled out really loud to you, you would identify that voice because you're familiar with it. So you have to become comfortable with your voice. And another example of that is like when you hear your voice on an answer machine, you'd be like, ooh. That's not how I thought I sounded. You have to become comfortable with how you sound. <laughs> right, right, right. I think the last thing for what we're all saying, the most important thing is to, to, to constantly search for it. How do I feel about this? What do I think about it? I call it reaching into a void. A good exercise for all of us is a long tone. You know, we think a long tone is the most boring exercise, but it's the deepest exercise we can play. It's where you just hold that tone and try to find yourself in that sound and make the sound and the feeling of it, to go with what Victor was saying, what, what Vince is saying, make that be, this is me. And you're going to reach for a long time into nothing. You have to have the faith and belief in what you're reaching for. Even though you don't see a result, give it two or three years, you're going to see a result. I once El asked Elvin Jones, do you, do you see an improvement in my playing over the course of four or five years I had known him? He said, come see me in 20 years. Well, it's been about 30 years since I asked him that. When he told me see him in 20 years, I thought, man, 20 years, I might not live 20 more years. I live 20 more years. Okay, so your long-term objectives. Good question, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Winton, what was your childhood like and how does that affect you as a musician now? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah. We all have childhoods. Yeah. It was full of a lot of things that were typical and a full of a lot of things that were atypical. It was full of things that I really liked and was very fortunate, and it was filled with many things that I was very unfortunate to deal with. I did a lot of things that were okay, and I did a lot of little dumb things. I, I was in a, it's like life is it's complicated. So my mama used to always say, do you wanna go to somebody else's house, baby? I'll send you to a house where no one has any problems but you're going to have to die to get there. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, and it, it affects me, of course, your childhood, it affects everyone, but I find it, it's, it's, for me, it's a matter of perspective, and I won't answer long so someone else can answer it. It doesn't, it does not, uh, th it depends on how things hit you, how you take things. Something bad happens to one person, they, they can't believe it, they can't survive it. Another one, it's like, okay, this happens. Another one is inspired. You know, we all experience life in so many different ways that the specifics of a person's experience, I, I don't know if they can com convey to you how they felt about it. And that question is so difficult, I'm trying to answer you, but it's hard. I'm just gonna leave it by saying, many things happened. <laughs> and, um, as you, as you get older, you develop a greater sense of gratitude. Just, you get older, you, you become more grateful, I think, for, for most of yes. Duke Ellington, when presented like with a uh, problem, he didn't look at it like it was a like problem, something that he had to overcome. He looked at it as uh, it presented a different set of opportunities. So no matter what happens, it's like, okay, I can go down this road, I can go down this road. What can I do in this situation to make it positive? And there you go. And uh, that's right. I'm gonna just, the last thing I wanna leave you with is how you feel when you walk around most of the time, really concentrate on making that be good how you feel, like when you're walking around in the daytime and nobody, you just, your, I had a teacher that told me that once, he called it your inner life. And he told me, he said, if your inner life is unhappy, you are unhappy. Not meaning yours is, that was a good question. You might be the most happy, the happiest person in the world. But he said, he told me, then I was 18 or 19 years old, he said, take care of that. Take care of your, and uh, things happen in, in child, beautiful things and you know, we all have it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Yes, sir. All right, this, is, this is for anyone in the band, but when it comes to composing, how do you develop your ideas for the melody and throughout, and who is your biggest idol when it comes to composing? That's a good question. Um, I, you know, I've seen my own development over the years and, and the tendencies and the mistakes and things that I have made in terms of how I've approached composing. I mean, I would say there's just there's too many great composers to name and I wouldn't say there's a favorite that I have, but I find that I, I look at success in, in the composing is how much it comes from something that I'm hearing and imagining, right? Not something that I can work out at the piano. When I'd start, I'd be like, okay, let me find a cool chord to go with this note. Let me try to, you know, find a chord change, you know, system here, and then I'll find some notes to go with it. And it, it ends up sounding very intellectual, and maybe it's got some hip harmonic twists and turns, but, you know, really who cares? Because it's not, it's not really a strong melodic statement. So in the last few years, I've, I've tried to get away from that way of writing and more towards just closing my eyes and hearing something, like, because I've absorbed a lot of music over the years. I'm in my 50s, I've been playing and listening to music for a long, long time, and hopefully I've got something inside of my brain, inside of my heart now that I can access. So I close my eyes, I lay on the couch sometimes and say, what's next, what's coming next? And I actually hear it, and, and then I try to capture that, 
So I'm not trying to work it out down here on a, on a piano or on my saxophone or whatever. I'm trying to capture the thing that I'm hearing and feeling. And I find that is more successful. So the things that I write when I do that are often, um, I feel better or more at least uh, expresses something more personal. And it also flows more because it's, it's something that I can imagine. I was talking to Glenn Close, who's an actress, and she said, I asked her about her, her method of acting. Is it technique? Is it method? And she just kind of looked at me and said, I don't know about all that. I just use my imagination. I said, wow. And so from then on, I said, all, all I'm going to do right now is just use my imagination. We have concerts coming up in, in, a, in, in a week of Ornette's music, and I wrote a couple arrangements for that. And I tried to put aside all the, the bad habits and the ways that I have done orchestrating in the past and try to find a new way of writing, which is just purely based on that comment she made, which is use your imagination. And um, we'll see how it turns out. <laughs> but uh, um, so it's, it's very personal. And I feel like the more personal it is, the more uh, I enjoy the process. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yes. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that I like to play in like a smaller setting is I feel it's easier for me to really show who I am uh, personality wise. So one, uh, the burning question I had was um, how do I do that in a big band setting? Um, there's less space in the big band. So instead of showing how you are in a big band, you have to show how we are. Okay, I played in a small band all the time. We just played last week with the St. Louis Symphony. When I played in a small band, it was always me playing. Played all night, played solos, I love to play, go sit in, play jam session all night. But to be able to sit back and just hear the lead trumpet Ryan Kaiser was playing, just to sit next to it and hear it, 20-something years we've been playing, unbelievable. I'm gonna take you to a, something Marcus Printup said, to hear Kenny play on Black, brown, and beige. Two solos, the, two different styles of soloing. To hear Marcus, I'm just speaking in my section because we play together, to hear Marcus print up over all these years and to think, hey, we sat in a pit in 1992 or 93 and played. Now we're up here on the stage, we're still playing. They've had that opportunity to look back and see Tatum and remember when he was at Essential Ellington in 1999. <laughs> and the fantastic playing He's doing and teaching to be a part of a greater thing than yourself. It's unbelievably gratifying. We still get to play. We only play one time a night. It takes years to learn how to play, but you also get to listen to many more people play. So just the enjoyment of listening to those musicians is something I had less of on a bandstand with lesser musicians. Now, let's, one time we were in a rehearsal, and Doug Womble had written a piece for the trumpet to play a solo, and he gave the solo to me, but it was a solo that Marcus would have been much better playing. So I was kind of playing it, but we all knew Marcus would play it better, so Herlin kind of started laughing. So I said, hey, Marcus should play, the, 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 play this part. He's going to play it much better than I'm going to play it. It's, he knows how to play this style. Marcus took the solo, so everybody started teasing me. Oh, you got to give the part to Marcus. Oh, you can't play. You got to give the part to Marcus. Come on, Marcus, Marcus. And then Marcus said, Marcus said, well, I don't know about any one of us, but if you put the four of us together, you have one hell of a trumpet player. Mm. Like, think about all of the trumpet we can now play with each other, if we can, not have to hog the ball. Mm. Man, I heard so much great music playing with them. Now, I'm going to go to the sections. I'm only talking about my section. The saxophone section. The nights I've heard them. Just this last week, playing Bernstein's Prelude, Fugues, and Riffs, not a style that we normally play, to get that fugue together. What they did, when they sit down and play, the depth of the feeling they were playing with, how we feel. Sometimes we're playing, we just listen to them, but we look at each other and we begrudgingly go, damn, <laughs> saxophones. <laughs> Fantastic feeling, and then across the band. Now, many times I go to the trombones. You got Chris, man, just... Chris alone. I was telling a story earlier about Ted and I looking across after Chris wrote an original piece of music. We couldn't see each other because we have these over 50 eyes. We can make out each other's heads, but we can't really see eyes because if you're gonna, you have a choice. Either you're going to read music or you're going to look at a face. <laughs> okay, so we, we choose that we have to read music so we can't see faces. <laughs> but we could both tell when we stood up. We were, we were, we were full. We were kind of crying because of respect we had for the job he did and how fantastic he is as a human being. 
So as we walked off of this stage, just two or three years ago, Ted asked me, hey, man, were you crying? I, of course, I was getting ready to lie and say no. <laughs> but I said, yeah, man, I, I, I got full. He said, is it that we're just getting old? <laughs> okay, these are all experiences we won't have if we don't play with each other. Mm. Playing with Ted Nash, I would not have played with him. I had a quintet. I, many years I played with him. I would not have played with Paul, James. Elliot normally is the last person to solo. I don't know why. It's always kind of, you get down near the end and Elliot solos. And when Elliot starts to solo and we all look around at how great he sounds, we go, oh yeah, him. <laughs> he waited the whole night. He's going to play one song. And when he starts to play, so the collective identity is so much more powerful than the individual identity. It does not mean you don't need the individual identity. It doesn't mean the individual identity is not important, but you're still very young. As you get older, you start to understand because you have more of your life invested in the collective identity. You have a family, you have a community, you have people you're responsible for. Now, your thinking is much more collective. It's always we. Whereas when you're young, you're thinking, man, I got to do this. I, I have to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so that's, once again, we're talking about polarity. You don't have to choose. I'm not less of a trumpet player because I play with the great Ryan Kaiser or Marcus Prenner, mm. Kenny Rampton. These great trumpet players that I have the opportunity to play with makes me a better trumpet player. Mm. I solo less, but I play better. One thing I want y'all to notice is the importance of balance when you're playing. Okay, when you get on the stage, invariably you're not going to be able to hear things, you're going to want things a certain way. You play on different stages, it's never the way you want it. So when you first start playing, instead of panicking, and I wish it was louder, I need a monitor, I need to start trying to balance. Don't play so soft that you can't be heard and not so loud that nobody else can be heard. Get a sense of how you want to balance from the beginning. The music is generally designed for you to balance to the guitar and the bass, because those are generally the softest instruments. Once the bass gets the amp and turns up where it's louder than the band, then it becomes more difficult to balance. But even if that is the case, you gotta try to figure out how you're gonna work your balance out. One of the most difficult things in music is to balance. Um, okay, you don't have to be shy if you wanna ask more questions. Seem, seem like we lost everybody, yes. Oh. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, Hi. Hello. So my question is for you, Mr. Marsalis. Yes, sir. Um, I know that you've had like an amazing classical as well as jazz career when um, most people like spend their whole like entire lives dedicated to just one. So I was just wondering how you did that with both styles. First, I love the styles. And my father was not tribal or prejudiced in any, in any way. So any kind of prejudice that you learn or stupidity that you're thinking that you get in your head that people repeat over and over again, because my father was always like, hey, if you want to play something, you got to work on it. Hey, if you can, he didn't associate the music with a tribe. He associated with music. So when I started to learn how to play it, I was free to, to learn it. And uh, I was blessed to be in New Orleans at a certain time where you could work a lot when you were younger. I got a lot of experience and older musicians were very kind and uh, I was just kind of lucky and fluky. I had the, the opportunity to do it. I grew up playing with jazz musicians. We were mainly playing a style of funk that we were calling jazz. But because I knew my father and them could play jazz, I always wanted to play like them. But we were mainly playing like Parliament, the Earth, Wind and Fire tunes, Tower Power, that kind of stuff. And it just, people said it was jazz. And um, so for me, but I think all of us have studied some type of, uh, of classical music. If, if, even if it's not classical music, we've studied a, 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 form, a pedagogic, we have a, a, we have a, a literate pedagogic foundation. This exercises and other things that's not necessarily a style of music. And uh, I think also for me, I was fascinated with composition. Like I loved Haydn's music. I wanna, contest when I was 14 to play with the New Orleans Philharmonic, and I'll never forget the sound of the orchestra when it hit a note. Just, boom, just the sound that came out of the rehearsal. And uh, it, it helped me to have a, a through those years, an abiding love for that music. Haydn, Beethoven, Mozart, Shostakovich, Bartok, Stravinsky, 
Bruckner. The one thing I'm most uh, fortunate about is to have developed at a young age the ability to hear that type of music in those long forms. I think that it helped me with my listening of longer forms. And it also gave me a way to not fill my entire listening space up with commercial products. Because like everybody my age, I love commercial products. But there's a long distance between a commercial product and the B minor mass. So when I started to also listen to jazz, like to hear John Coltrane's playing on something like Blue Train, or it's a big difference between that and the commercial products that we liked. So to develop kind of over the years your hearing so that you can hear things that are not commercial products and you can hear commercial products also, you get that kind of combination that we've been talking about. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, so one thing I've noticed a lot is that jazz is really um, dominated by um, like males, um, just uh, players, everyone. Um, and I've noticed that like even as a, like a lead player, I'm really discouraged like from being out there because it's just so predominated by like males. Um, so I guess my question is like, what are your thoughts on female influence throughout the history of jazz and who has been your like biggest inspiration um, as a like a female instrumentalist, not just like a vocalist? I think that it's been a paucity of, uh, of females of a, of a certain heft mm -hmm. in jazz. For me, my favorite is Mary Lou Williams. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to make a point to you that's important. Everywhere I went, I was almost always the only black person, mm -hmm. even now in New York. I walk up and down, I walk in the rooms all the time, only black person. You name it. I've been, some cultural things I go to, I was one in the 80s, I was the only black person. Now, it's 2000s, so I'm the only black person. Now, I grew up in segregation. So what I have to tell you is something that my mother believed in. When you don't see yourself, put yourself there. Now, when we first started having integration, we were all used to sitting on the back of buses. Just conditioning. That's where you sat. You sit in the back. My father used to always say, don't sit in the back of a bus. But it was natural to you to sit in the back. You didn't know why it was natural. You were used to sitting in the back. Mm -hmm. So he would say, go sit in the front of the bus. I never sat in the front of the bus. But my brother did. I said, hey, man, why are you sitting in the front of the bus? Daddy told me to sit in the front. When you don't see yourself... If you really want to see yourself in a place, put yourself in that place. Mm -hmm. Will you have opposition? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that opposition ever stop? Mm hmm Is there an opposition to racism? Mm hmm <laughs> It's much more than it was in 1813. Mm -hmm. So you either create the world you want to see, which part of that is decrying the one that exists. But when you decry the world that exists, figure out how can I put myself in the position to create change. And one thing younger people represent, why it's always very important for me, with all youngsters and all of students, to be as for real and absolute as I can possibly be about challenges and issues. Life is not a playground. It's just not. We need you all to be different from how we are. We need you to create change. That change is very hard earned because who's going to sacrifice? Who's going to give up? Okay, let's say we wanted to put, uh, just put a woman in the band. Who's going to give up their job for that? I want a woman in the band tomorrow. Somebody quit. I want a black person at this. Who's going to give up what they have? So we have a tradition and a history in the world of sectarianism, of racism, at a certain point, you run out of others to attack. Then you start to attack yourself. It's like a virus that feeds on something. It's going to eat the liver up, kidneys. It starts looking around, man, what can I eat next? It's only, only men and women in the world when you get down to the basics of it. Once you no longer have to deal with black folks, you don't have to deal with Mexicans or whoever the other is that you want to attack or that they're not. Now, who are you going to start looking at? Man, you're in your own house. Let me put a camera in my kid's room. I hate these kids. Oh, they're so disrespectful. I just need to slap them. Now, where else you going to look? You see, so 
So, so far as uh, just the condition we find ourselves in, is not uh, the history of the world would not lead you to think that equality is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. It's something we have to consistently and always fight for. Mm -hmm. That's just a reality. And, and in terms of f females that I respected or I love, Mary Lou Williams, in terms of her playing. But I have to say, you, you said not vocalist, but I do have to say that for me, um, for our institution, I wrote a set of 12 principles. Mm -hmm. and, and the first one is embody the music you serve. And with those principles, I was thinking of who is the person I knew that most embodied, that I knew, most embodied this music. And the person who's in that essay is Betty Carter. Because of the people I knew, she was the most absolutely for real. But she wasn't a kind of sweet, touchy-feely poster girl. But she was so absolutely for real about the music, about teaching people. And she and I didn't get along. But I was a kid. And the respect I had for her, when I would go to her gigs and when I saw her and the quality of her bands and the way she defended this music and the integrity she had, all these years later, I still say Betty Carter. So if I have to say the number one person of who I saw that I felt created more great bands was the deepest, had the most integrity about the music. And I was playing with Art Blakey and he, he agreed with that too. So that's a long answer, but that's what I think. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma um, when you were our age uh, in high school, what was your biggest struggle as a musician, and how did you overcome that to become the musician you are today? Phew. My, well, my biggest struggle was just being sad. I mean, my daddy was always saying, man, you can't play. So for me, I always wanted my father and the other musicians who could play to say, you could play. But they were always like. <laughs> I, was, I was telling a story earlier about my father. After I won two Grammys, my father had gone out. He saw the Grammy Award show, and he was in Hollywood. He's not into all that kind of stuff. You know? he just, he's not against it. He's just not into it. He saw what it was. He was kind of assessing it. So after the show, I was in my father's room. I was getting ready to go out, have a good time. Asked my daddy and my mama there, hey, man, you know the Grammys. My daddy said, yeah, man, you know the Grammys. That's pretty good. Yeah, you know, just, somebody's got to win. He said, ah, Hollywood, wow, yeah. He's, he said, hey, man, you don't think this means you can play, do you? <laughs> and like, he, you have to understand him to know that I did not in any way take it as a, trying to douse me. It was a legitimate concern. If somebody's got to win these awards, you won one. But Clark Terry can play, <laughs> not you. <laughs> learn how to play. So for me, the whole thing was, can I play? Can I learn how to play? And the second thing I always wondered about is, can I actually become a jazz musician? Because we're mainly playing funk and pop music. Can I figure out what it takes to actually play real jazz? And I love the music we play. So I also don't want to give you all the impression that I'm against styles of music. Some vulgarity I'm against. I'm, I'm really against it for kids. But there are many styles of music. There are many types of people. And you can learn something. My father used to always tell me, go play this gig. Play every gig you can. You can learn something from any style you play. It's just important to be clear about the function and purpose of styles. Not to be prejudiced against styles. You can take any style and create whatever you want from that style. That's our natural creativity. But I would say that my major Thing was, can I learn how to actually play like Clifford Brown or people on these records that really can play instead of like me? Victor talked about hearing his sound, but when I heard my sound, I wanted to harm myself. I had no idea I was that sad. So, you know, that's, that's how I was thinking. Anybody want to? Yes, sir. Taylor. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, I want to address your question because uh, I had along with Carlos Enriquez and Patrick Bartley, uh, had the opportunity to be in your position of being a student at essentially Ellington. For me, it was back in... <coughs> but... Um, when I was in high school... Because your, your question, you, you asked, where were, how, did, how did you... Where were you at? What were you struggling with at this point? And how did you get to this point, right? Yeah. Um, when I was your age, I had the distinct feeling that if only I got to here, then I'd make it, right? 
got into essentially Ellington. I met Wynton Marsalis. I'm good. No. I just put me into a different category of people that all knew Wynton Marsalis. Now you're one of still 8 million people, right? <laughs> if I just got a scholarship to college, then I'm in. Move to New York, then I'm in. Get the call from so-and-so, then I'm in. And every level that that actually ended up happening, I realized, no, now you're just here. There's never a point where you feel like you got it. You know, I mean, you go back to Socrates. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. The thing that develops is your ability to deal with the parts of yourself, your playing, your life that you want to improve. For me personally, it was a matter of getting better at accepting the things I couldn't do. That was my, that's, that's what I had to deal with. It was really hard for me at 17 to accept that I sucked at something. I'm older than that now. I'm more aware of the things that I can't do and I'm okay with that, right? Certain things, they're harder for me to do than others. But you're always gonna feel like there's something that you're trying to get to, right? It's not, it's not a stepwise thing. It's a constant plane of improvement and trying to get better at stuff, right? And I think that that, I mean, for me personally, that's how I've, I can look at it from this point of view as opposed to that point of view. But know that you're probably gonna be asking that question a lot for the rest of your life. But it's a good question to be asking. Thank you. So my question is directed towards everybody or anybody in the band. Um, what do you think is missing from young people when you hear them play? Yeah, like, yeah. Good afternoon. Um, I think that what is missing um, is uh, one basic fundamentals. Uh, and, and I'm a little sympathetic to it because now we're in this age where everything is moving really fast. You know, even in like popular culture, music is all fast. You almost don't hear anything slow. And so there's a tendency to maybe not want to practice slow things. Uh, but the fact is, in order to develop a sound on the instrument, you must, as you know, the horn player has mentioned, practicing low tones. You know, to develop a sound on a cymbal, you have to practice it like this. And that's just one sound. You know, it's very tedious, but that's how you develop clarity on, you know, one of these instruments out of many. Um, so I think that a lot of times it, c it can be easy to either want to skip that or to take that for granted. And so that's one thing that, that can be missing. Another thing that is missing is uh, the experience of having a role to play in music. And again, uh, this is one of the things that um, I'm envious of Wenton with is he was fortunate to come along at a time where he was able to play school dances. I mean, they were playing funk music, but they were, they were able to have bands that played for dances at schools. And unfortunately, by the time I came along, um, those bands were replaced with DJs. And so, unfortunately, we've had less and less of an opportunity to play to where you have a role that you play in the music. I mean, one of the reasons that uh, the, 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 the music, the older music was swinging so hard is that a lot of those drummers had experiences playing for dances and playing for dancers. And at that point, it's not about how fast you're playing or how many complex rhythms you're playing. I mean, it is about the role that you have at that time in the music. In fact, there's a story about uh, Elvin Jones was hired to play this gig with uh, Tyree Glenn. And it was just a basic, you know, just playing two and four and uh, just, you know, chopping wood. It was just real basic swing. And so this was a gig. And I mean, I even hear that in Elvin's playing through a lot of the complex things he plays. I hear that basic swing in his playing. Well, anyway, he, I think, leaves the gigs and sends his sub to play. And when he comes back, there's a different drummer there. And he's like, well, what happened to the drummer you sent? Apparently, the drummer thought that he was supposed to play the way Elvin Jones played with John Coltrane, which is very different and not appropriate for that gig. And Elvin Jones was told, man, that sub that you sent, man, was just did a horrible job with the music, and we fired him. And since you sent him, you're fired too. <laughs> yeah, that's how it was back then. 
But when you have a role to play, then your job depends on it. You could be hired or fired based on whatever that role is. So I think that those are um, some things that are missing nowadays. Can I add one thing to that? Um, it's interesting to hear Jason speak about because Winton and I grew up together in New Orleans. And I think what's missing for you all are opportunity, taking it out of the musical context is the opportunity to interact with each other because X amount of years later, when Winton and I sit around and reminisce, we say, man, remember that dance at Xavier Prep? That was an all girls high school hall. Remember that dance at St. Mary's Academy? <laughs> Or you remember that time we were on the top of Gaylord, which was a great place where they had all these different type of social environments with peers. So I can only hope that this many years later for you, you will have the opportunity to speak to someone that you've been in touch with for so many years to say, remember that time we were at Essentially Ellington in 2018? And then you'll be able to pull upon that to remember some great experience that made you the persons that you will be at that time. And I, I just want to say, say one thing about this. It's, there's no such thing really as young people. Like let's, people are people. They're going to be young, then they're going to be old. Like when I think of young people, Tatum is young people to me. Carlos is young people. Chris Crenshaw is young people. Paul Nazella is young people. What do I think about young people? I love them. Young people who are sitting here, okay, you're a certain age, different types of seriousness. I've always, somebody always say you, the past was this or the past. Let me tell you, what my, to me, the past I was in was sad. I never thought, we got so many great musicians around here, and this is so great in these young people today. They just don't, I have never felt that. I feel like there's so much possibility in younger people. You're people. You're young now, you're 60. I thought I was, I, I was in publicity. I was 19 for 15 years. I was in my 30s, and they were still saying, 19-year-old trumpet player. <laughs> I stayed young for a long time. It wasn't until I started go going bald that I became old, <laughs> okay? But the thing about that is to be young doesn't mean anything. Now, once again, in a commercial environment, you are a market. So because you are a market, you're given the illusion that to be young means some type of power. <laughs> I never figured out what it was. Except you could, your parents could buy something, and you eventually will buy those same things when you get a little older. But if you take just the creativity in this room, the intelligence, the amount of work, the dedication, the seriousness. I, I know that I'm going to cry three or four or five times in this festival from what people play. And I have to say, down through these years, when I look at my young people, Carlos, Tatum, Jason, they're young. Chris, young people are fantastic. And I, that's not the kind of, hey, young people. <laughs> that's saying, you know, young people... We have to provide a world for them so that they can become adults. A young person, a kid, is not going to lead the way. They never led the way, and they're not going to lead the way. And if you think they are, think of yourself when you were 16. Would you want your 16-year-old self leading your, remember your old self? No, you're not going to follow yourself as a teenager unless you've had a very rough time out here. So, uh, I believe in the, in, the, in the creativity and the power of our younger people. I believe that we have let our younger people down. If, when I see problems in our culture, I believe there's problems. We've let them down because we've allowed ourselves to sell products to them and not take care of them and nurture them and give them the type of opposition they need to grow. Anyway, you need opposition to get better. You know, and I feel that we're going to hear some fantastic things here in these next few days. And to me, you all are young people. You know, it's not every bad example is of young people, and good examples don't really count. So uh, the, the, the one challenge I see for them is the whole kind of giving over to machines. A human being is the greatest machine on earth, not something you're looking at or holding in your hand. The greatest thing you're going to encounter sits next to you or is around you, there's nothing greater than people. So invest energy in human capital. And that's, uh, that's what I think about that. Hi. Um, 
So this question is for the rhythm section, specifically for um, Mr. Henriquez. So I'm a bass player, and um, a lot of the times I hear people playing a lot of stuff between the notes. And sometimes I think maybe it helps them swing harder, and sometimes I think maybe it doesn't. How do you think you can drive a rhythm section and swing hard just with quarter notes? Well, that's, that's one of the methods I started using as a, a young musician. Uh, because in high school, that's all I did was just play too many notes. And I think it happens, it's a physical thing that happens as you, when you're young. Because uh, you're young, you want to run around, you got all this energy. Uh, you don't think that doing something slower or simple is going to be the right way. So w what I used to do, and I still do to this day, is something that's consistent all the time, is I always practice quarter notes. And it doesn't have to be a note just your right hand on the string with a metronome and just move it around, you know, in different tempos. And you start internalizing that rhythm as you play. And uh, the more you get used to it, your body gets used to it. And it becomes a muscle memory situation with the bass and your hands too, you know. But once you start working those details out, it, um, it makes it much easier for you to play simple. So now I'm 38 and I find myself now playing more simpler than, than I used to when I was younger. And, and I find myself uh, swinging harder that way um, because I'm choosing the right, at this moment, the right notes, you know, but uh, still quarter notes. So I would suggest uh, for practice and for any other bass players who, who, who want to try this is just pick up, um, just pick up a towel or anything, right, and just mute your left hand. Let's forget about the note for a minute, right? And I want you to do this with your right hand. Do it on the D string, right? Do it on the A string. Do it on the E string, right? And then you start switching strings and try to get a nice boxy sound. And then you start speeding it up, you know? Right? And when you start swinging fast, And you just continue doing that. You start building muscle. It's just like lifting weights. And uh, once you get it, it becomes natural. It's a second, you know, second nature. So that's what I would suggest. And, and the, the middle notes, there, there are middle notes. Um, you know, we, we know of Ray Brown. Everybody likes the chakata boom, all those triplets and all that crazy stuff. Um, they're designed for certain things. They're, they're lopes. They're, they're, they're falls that go on the right spot. And you have to listen to their style of music and figure out why they're meant. So another thing is to analyze those bass players, not just Ray, other bass players, and figure out why are they doing what they're doing and analyze the other instruments because sometimes it's a call and response. Sometimes somebody else plays something and it's a response for the bass player to do something. So I hope that answered that. How much would you say that your equipment, you know, your instrument, your mouthpiece, everything, um, contributes to your sound? She said, how much would you say your equipment or your mouthpiece contributes to your sound? Um, well, what, what instrument do you play? Trumpet. Aha, trumpet, okay. So brass player. Um, it still goes back to the, the saying that you get out of it what you put into it. You know, that's, that's a lifelong lesson that you can take with you everywhere that you go. And as far as your equipment, I mean, I don't know, I don't know per se for trumpet players, but I know for trombone that um, it's, it's all dependent on what you choose, what kind of sound you're looking for, if you're looking for a big sound or a small sound, but it doesn't matter about the size of the mouthpiece or the size of the equipment. It's about what you put into it in, ter in terms of your air quality. And um, also, just the amount of time that you spend on your mouthpiece alone can help you in your regard to finding out what kind of sound you're gonna have. And um, as a trumpet player, um, I know that there are probably some times where you feel like after you're playing that, you know, you just wanna throw it away sometimes because your mouth feels so, so bad after playing sometimes. But um, I know of one exercise, and I think I went over this once with, I think we were in Brazil somewhere, 
I think we had a master class, and I was talking about how you could find your comfortable seal whenever you're playing in, in your mouthpiece. And you just choose a note, and you take a little bit off the mouthpiece, kind of like you're taking a sip of water. <laughs> Peel off of it a little bit, and then once you put it back on, then you'll find out where you're most comfortable playing in all of your partials. And, um, and then you'll find out that your endurance will go up that much more. It's just the amount of time that you spend on, you know, that type of uh, technique. So you take it again. And notice how the air is still present. If the air stops, if the air stops, then that means you're using your, you're using your lip muscles. If the air doesn't stop, then that means you're using your air correctly. And also, if you feel the burn on your corners, then you're fine. If you feel the corner, in the, if you feel it in the middle of your mouth, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. So, hope that helps. Thank you. I just want to say, want to say one quick thing. Hello. Just to elaborate on that a little bit more, no disrespect to Mr. Crenshaw, but from a specific trumpet player point of view. <laughs> um, the equipment that you play, it's gonna depend a lot on the job that you have to do, right? If you're sitting in a lead trumpet chair, you're not gonna wanna play a one and a half C on a large bore horn. I mean, you could, and if you can, God bless you. But by the second set of the gig, you're gonna be bleeding and playing on cracked teeth, right? The, and, and vice versa. If you're, if you're playing a classical concerto, you don't wanna do that on your shilky pea shooter, you know? I mean, if you can, God bless you, but you're gonna hurt a lot of people's ears by the end of the night, you know? So, depending on the job that you have to perform, it could be even down to the style of music, right? If you're on a salsa gig, you want to play different equipment than if you're in a jazz quintet, right? So, think about what it is that you have to, that it's being asked of you, and what kind of sound you want to get. Different equipment will give you different elements of sound. A smaller mouthpiece is going to give you a brighter sound. It's not going to change you and your personal sense of your sound, but it's going to it's gonna sort of accent different elements of your, of your sound and style. And it might, means, might, might make certain things easier, might make certain things harder. So from a very, very specific point of view, think about what it is that you have to accomplish and let your equipment sort of fill in those gaps, right? You don't want the equipment to do the work for you, but it can, it can help sort of make things a little bit better in terms of the specifics. Right. The more you know about it, the more you can pick things that are good for you. Like now that I'm older, I wish I would have spent more time with equipment. I played with Luce Olaf. He used to change mouthpieces in between phrases. <laughs> so we would always laugh, you know, with him. And he's so, he's such, so fantastic. I didn't know he could do it. He could pick up a, another mouthpiece and hit a high A and put another one in. But uh, I wish I would have invested more time. I think it's worth, worth the investment of time trying different mouthpieces and shanks and boards and things like that that could help. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my question is mostly directed to Carlos. Um, the question I have is that I know the technique of bass playing has changed um, over the area, eras of jazz. Um, how would you approach um, your technique if you were playing like an older uh, style of jazz? Would you like drop your technique, or would you just keep the same technique and adjust it? Right, what do you consider older style of jazz? Right? What, like what you, you're trying to say, like something in the early 1900s, like 1920s, 30s? Um, say if you were playing uh, like slap bass, or if you okay. were. That's cool. That's, well, you know the bass has changed many different formats and ways. Um, those who have heard music from the 70s, 60s, and 70s, hearing how the bass is been uh, played, that certain sound, people call it the twang sound, um, which I like, you know, many great bass players, Stanley Clark, Eddie Gomez, people who I admire. Um, but you, what I would say um, is you have to know, the question you're asking, right? Well, you have to know what era you're playing and what part of that era you're playing. So what I would do and what I do now is, first I listen to what they do, you know, there's so much music out there that you could reference to. And once you know that sound, you have to do your research and figure out, okay, what instrument were they using? Now, the majority of those jazz records that you're listening to, they all played gut strings. They didn't play, they didn't play metal strings. 
and um, their string heights were higher. And, you know, it's, it's a way different way of playing. So I tend to try to compensate to what their world was to the world that I'm living in now. So, you know, you have to find a happy medium. Um, and then after you do that, you got to search, okay, who do I know that are videotaped or um, recorded slapping? You start checking out Pops Foster, Mill Jackson, I mean, Mill Hinton, excuse me, uh, Steve Brown. Uh, these are cats that, that were known for this type of stuff, woman bro. And, and then you start listening to that, and then you start trying to do it yourself. Um, the, the bass is a very uh, tricky instrument, too, when it comes to this stuff, because like Winton said, it's an instrument that's it's not the loudest instrument on stage. And um, we're living in a generation where they crank it to become the loudest instrument on stage, which I like, too. If I'm loud, I'm going to be happy. I don't mind. But, you know, you got to give respect towards the music that you're playing in. You know, the bass is not a, an instrument that's supposed to be that, you know, that loud. So you got to understand, you know, the physics of what you're dealing with. Um, you have to spend the time studying the instrument, figuring it out, looking at pictures. I've spent years of looking at pictures. This bass that I have here now belonged to the great Bobby Rodriguez, who recorded all of the uh, Machito, Tito Puente recordings from the 30s on to the death of, of, of you know, till he passed away and I was able to inherit this instrument. So I, I saw pictures of this bass with Charlie Parker, with many other cats, and I saw how high the strings were. And I could almost measure just visually that they were an inch, an inch and a half away with gut strings. So you gotta analyze and see what they, you know, what they did. And at a certain point, you gotta sit down, you gotta say, you know, I, I'm not gonna be able to do that or what they did because it's gonna en enable, you know, not, not give you the proper way of playing with the music that's happening now, too. So you gotta find that little happy medium in the middle. And, and many different practices for, these, for this instrument. And you know, you and I could talk later so I could actually, you know, show you things, because I don't wanna make this a bass master class. But the bass is very interesting. And there are many ways of creating the sound that you want, but you have to do the, the homework and dedicate your time to it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, how does leadership within the band transfer as new ideas or interpretations about the music arise? That's a good question. How does leadership, you said how does leadership transfer, between transfer the from one, one to another? Well, it's a check down. Let's, let's talk about it just what a check down system is. Check down is the order of priorities about decision making. Okay. So if, you, if it's your arrangement, you're the leader. If you're soloing, you're the leader. If we're playing, the drums is the leader. If we get off, Victor or someone in the front is the leader. When we're rehearsing, if we're rehearsing your arrangement or you're the music director, you're the leader. If you get lost in the form, Dan or Carlos is the leader. So what happens is we have an elaborate kind of system we've worked out over the years. We play without a conductor, but we're looking around all the time to determine. In the beginning, the hardest part of my job was trying to figure out who soloed. I would sit up with a set list for two hours, just making sure everybody solos every night. Now at this point, when we get down two or three tunes from then, people in the band start looking around and say, well, so-and-so is not solo. Marcus Chris on the last tour, Chris was like two tunes from then, so-and-so is not solo. We try to share the leadership in a lot of different ways. When we have a dispute, I'm the leader. <laughs> if we have like a serious dispute, right now I'm the leader. If we're rehearsing, I'm the leader. In my section, Ryan Kaiser is the leader. If he plays the phrase a certain way, that's how I'm going to play it. If a, a funny thing happened, we were playing a Bernstein show in, a, in London. And it's the end of the tour. So, you know, we're tired of our chops, and there's a lot of blowing going on, and Ryan, he's playing. I'm always sensitive to the way he is. We get down to the end of the tune. So I'm suggesting to Vincent, he's the music director, so he has to do all of the announcing and everything, so there's not a lot of time. It's a lot of pressure. So we get near that last tune. I'm trying to cut one of the tunes, which features me. So, hey, Vince, Vince, Vince. I get him, you know what I'm saying? So he's, now he has the mic in his hand. He's getting ready to talk to, to the people. The world-famous Barbican Center, he says, uh, so he turns around, I said, 
cut that last tune. He said, no. We're going to play now. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> you remember? <laughs> and that was it. That's how, the, that's how it works. And because everybody writes, everybody has music. We've had different music directors at different times. And there's going to be a time that most of us are not here. And we want to try even now to make sure that the band is something that can keep going. We're, we're, for the older of us, we're looking at our chairs. How are we going to create an environment where whoever comes into these chairs has a sense of the history and the tradition of the band and don't just destroy everything we did immediately? You know, so I hope that, did that make sense? If, if that's not how somebody has... And also sections and leaders. We always say follow the lead, lead trumpet, phrase like lead trumpet. Alto lead or the tenor lead, who's playing lead? Who are you playing with? We're in a rehearsal, we'll say many times, who am I playing with? Can you hear me? Do you know what you're playing? Are you following me? Can you see me? Because we have so many arrangers, I think that our rehearsals are different from any rehearsals that probably have ever existed in our music of a larger ensemble. Because people are always talking about who you playing with, what is this voicing, what is it that you did, how did you do that, can we change that? And also there's a level of interest, like Carlos is always ahead of time checking the music. He's always listening to tapes, and he's, when we had to do the Bernstein piece, I wasn't even aware that we were playing it. I thought we were just augmenting the symphony. So it started with Dan told me, man, I've been practicing my part. I said, your part? We're playing with, we're not, well, and Carlos said, hey man, did you listen to this tape? They're playing on the offbeat, where's the downbeat? So that's a week ahead, and uh, with all these things, we were doing a recording in St. Louis. He, Carlos, would send me a list of things he thought went wrong that night. So there's many different types of leadership that, that go on in the band. Okay, okay. yes, ma'am. Yes. Hi. Um, how do you keep intensity in your groove while staying relaxed? Um, First is, I think uh, you have to have the, the concept of being relaxed and realizing that you can't use, for example, you can't use too much of your arm or if you're tensing up like this, uh, no, you've got to have the concept of, you know, using mostly your wrist, one, you know, just to, that's, that's first. And second thing is that it's, it's all in the attack. That's the thing, it's all in the attack and, you know, because you don't want like this kind of, no, that's not good. But if it's like this, you know, you, know, you want a, that, that second, you want a, a good attack. And also, you want to, uh, you want the resonance of the sound to, to, to help you and to take over. You know, because fortunately, since this is a really resonant symbol, See all that ring? You know, I don't have to do a lot. You know, you know, I don't have to do all this, you know. And so you have to let the, um, you know, resonant, resonance of the sound help you with what you're playing. And so those are some things that help, just from a drum standpoint, you know, to, to, to keep the intensity, you know. Uh, but also just staying relaxed, you know. I think those are the things that can help with that. Okay, Todd Stone was distracting me. <laughs> and Jeff Hamilton, two very disruptive. <laughs> two? The disruptive persons here. Yeah. Uh, in, intensity. I think the more, like, like what Jason said before, about getting comfortable with where you're placing your notes within the time. So we, we don't even have to think about that. Wherever we're placing those notes, it's just right right where we need it to be. And then keeping that intensity up, it doesn't have to be loud, but then we're starting to talk about like quality of sound. So just like the English that you address each note with, that's what's gonna give you that intensity. 
And as soon as you start thinking, oh, am I, where's my, where's my beat? You know, as soon as other things enter your mind, that's where you lose it. So that, that sense of evenness, that sense of meter, that sense of time, that's first. And then it's a matter of really being able to listen to the quality of your sound and how you're actually going to address all those notes. Yeah. And I think the last thing is be intense. <laughs> be intense. I used to have a coach that used to say, we'll be playing ball, and he would say, I need more emotion. I need more emotion. The whole game be screaming for emotion and passion. And when we get to the last two minutes, he would say, replace all that emotion with execution. So if you're intense, if you really be intense, tense is not volume. One, one last thing I'd like to say, if you get used to playing really loudly, you'll never be intense. It's like using curse words to make a point. You'll never learn how to use language. It's cursing is just easier. If you learn how to, and I want you also to think about sometimes some of the most intense encounters you have if people will be quiet, especially your parents. Maybe they say, sit down. <laughs> that means, okay. I wanted to ask if um, you think that humans and music have always been sort of connected, or if humans created music, if, if they found it, or? That's an interesting question. I, I don't, we probably all have different beliefs, but I personally believe that a human being had to be, music had to be part of the birth of humanity. The, the setting of the stars and the skies and all that. When, the, when, it, when, it, when the system came in, it had to have music in it. As a baby couldn't cry without music, so. There's a song that sounds great. Keep doing that. I mean, you know, song is before language, so. And music is such a fantastic thing to be a part of, but this, maybe somebody else thinks another thing. Um, oh, it's not cool. So I can't exactly speak for what the first, I mean, no one knows what the first sound <laughs> that was ever made was. But one thing that what, it, <laughs> right, exactly. <clears throat> Pardon me. But there's actually really, and I don't, I'm not going to sit here and, uh, openly endorsed Netflix documentaries as the primary form of information, but they can inspire you to do your own research. That's what it's supposed to do. There shouldn't be, you know, you don't go to Wikipedia to find exactly what you find it. You should get inspired to go do your own research on things. That's what everything should be like. But there's one documentary that was really interesting to me that I found on, on Netflix a couple of years ago by Nova, and it's called The Great Human Odyssey. And one of the things that it inspired me to research was that some of the first I mean, everyone should know this. Some of the first recorded things by humans was not language, written language. It was art. It was pictures. You know, they, they found evidence of certain, like, like, materials, like dust that people would mix with water to, like, paint on their faces for things. So clearly, if, it may not be directly connected to, you know, our musical conversation, but in terms of how music, how, like, art is connected with us and how music is an art, and, like, if, you know, you go back to the Greek definition of it, like, being skill, you know, if it means like to do something, to represent something, to communicate something, we clearly were communicating with art first. So if you want to think about that to inspire you to do some of your own research, I think that should also tying into what um, Jason was saying and, you know, other people, and, and James is saying about if you think about it too much, once other thoughts into your mind, it goes away. Think about that. The fact that we were communicating with art first and how it should feel natural and how no matter how much you practice, think about like what that means to you. Like how, how does it feel first? So clearly that's what they were thinking about, how it feels first. How can I represent an emotion? How do I communicate this feeling that I'm having? How do I communicate that I'm hungry? How do I communicate that I'm angry, that I'm happy, that I need something? These are all actually emotions. These necessities are actually emotions. So I don't know, something to think about. That's, I thought that was interesting for me. I think also remember people like to have fun. Animals like to have fun. You always have this vision of people like that they were very angry before they had fire. Ooh, 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 they sat around doing that. <laughs> Man, they weren't. Mm, mm, mm. All the emotions always guttural and angry. Mm, mm. That's not. They were probably mm, 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 in a funny way. Mm, mm. <laughs> you got to always remember one of the most basic impulses, right? The two things exist together. 
right next to the impulse of being afraid and wanting to harm someone is this. You know, ah, <laughs> what's happening, baby? You see, there's nothing wrong with that. So, and of course, you know, if the art was around, it's, it's around. We don't have recordings of what people were doing. They were probably singing when they were drumming. Hmm. Mm, and I killed 50 of these purple bison. Blah, 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 the mass. Uh, let me make myself be great in this. But now we can't see their signature. And I got the two mastodons. You know, it's the, the, you got to always remember that desire to lie and make up good stories. People were singing those. And you have to also remember the attractive quality of singing. Just look at birds. Look at, you know, when people can make pleasant sounds, other people like them. Sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> what qualities do you think or do you hope that students will develop from learning music? And how can our educators help them get there? Okay. I'm a, I can, you want, you, well, do you want? I think for us as educators, what you kind of hear us saying in many different ways is that it's important for us to help you to realize your own potential. We want you to be the best that you can be because as Mr. Marsalis said, you are the future. You know, we, it's our responsibility to help you to um, realize your dreams. And I think as music educators, as far as practicing music is concerned, whether you become a musician or not, that experience is so essential, as you already probably know, for helping you understand how to use your creativity, how to solve problems, how to think outside of the box, how to work together with a group of people, how to express your emotions, how to share your opinions. Whether you agree or disagree, you can still come together and make an idea become a reality. So these types of tools for us as educators is so important through music, especially jazz, because it's based on improvisation, that really helps you to have the tools that you can be the, the best that you can be and realize your potential and, and realize your dreams. That's why it's so important for you to play music. Right. I, and I think to, to answer part of what you were saying, to, to, to go with what Walter is saying, because he's, he's such a fantastic teacher, and I want to also say, when I think of young people, I think of Walter, because I, I, I met him when he was in high school. He could play. He's a fantastic teacher, speaks all kinds of languages and all that. But the thing I notice about his own method of teaching is how personal it is. So the first thing that he teaches you is a kind of basic love and warmth in the way he approaches when he talks to, to someone. I'm going to just go through a litany of things that the music can now teach you from a technical standpoint. First, first thing it teach you, teaches you is is that you have a creativity that is yours. Duke Ellington said, be a number one yourself, not a number two somebody else. So through improvisation, you get to develop the skill of this is what I think, and this is what it gives you a confidence in yourself. And because it's jazz, there's no one way to play it. There are millions of ways to play it. You could listen to a thousand musicians play the bass, Carlos starts name them, trumpet players. There's no one right way to play. They all play different ways and all beautiful in their own way those that play like that. The second thing it teaches you is that other people have the ability to improvise and you have to make space for them. So while it's teaching you to celebrate yourself, it's also teaching you, hey, let's celebrate Walter. Listen to all the horn he's playing. That's why I always look at jazz musicians, how they listen to each other play. Just, I just noticed my daddy and them, somehow I was playing, oh yeah, man, that's so-and-so. It's always very collegial and loving. So just to learn how to love another person's creativity it, it teaches you something very fundamental that you need in the world. People can be competitive, and because they are competitive, they're not an enemy. The world is a place of collaboration, but you cannot collaborate according to you. The collaboration is according to y'all. There's a common area. The music teaches you that. The next thing that the music teaches you in jazz is that sometimes stuff doesn't work out. You play a concert, you sound sad, it's not swinging. Something happens in your life, you know, hey, this, this is what the, what the world is. It's not, it's not a picture, your picture that you wrote and put yourself in the heroic role. You're here. And our music teaches you to face the reality of that. And don't be naive about it, 
but don't, don't kill yourself because something is wrong because it's also optimism. Now, in terms of practicing, it teaches you a history. Carlos told you, learn the history of these bass players. We were talking about the bass. It teaches you history. The second thing, it teaches you the lowest and highest aspirations of your people. There's a lot of ignorance in our music, and there's a lot of glorious moments in our music. It teaches you the self-discipline of practicing every day. And it's also a lot of fun. It teaches you how to work in the context of a group and work towards a goal and objective and to reach it sometimes and to not reach it sometimes. I always love the fact of losing anything because the fact that you can lose something makes you understand the value of it. And there's no shame in losing a thing unless it's, it, it, no matter, even, even if it's your life. We, we're not going to make it out of this. If we're in here right now, we're going we're gonna to all end up with that same grim battle. And it's important for us to lose graciously, to be soulful, and to account, because we're going to lose things in life. And it's, another thing the music teaches you is the comeback. I don't care how sad you sounded on Tuesday. When you pick your horn up or your instrument up on Wednesday, you better think, I'm going to sound better than I sounded. You got to have a jump shooter's mentality. I missed the last 50, but 51 is going in. You know, music teaches you all of these things. And then it teaches you the joy of collective expression. We all come together, we play this. And it teaches you the joy of individual expression. Then it teaches you to reach out to a community of people who are looking for you to heal them in some way. And it gives you that opportunity to be like a preacher or a doctor. Hey, I know y'all had a, 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 rough, a rough day today or a rough month, or a rough 10 years, but just check this out. Do -de -do 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 -do. It's like you're able to give something. So all of these things are in music, and there are many, many more. I'm going to talk about the math of it, or the, the invisible parts of it, like the feeling, the emotions, the thoughts, and all the things. All of these things. Music is such a fantastic art, and we're all so blessed and honored to be a part of it. And there have been so many great musicians. And the thing that jazz really allowed was for the memory of all these great musicians to be with us through their recordings. Because if you think about, now you could get to learn how to play a tenor saxophone, you can learn how to play a trumpet, you can learn how to play a piano, and people could hear you. Before, man, you had to orchestrate and write all of that music. There's a lot fewer people who are going to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I want to thank you all very much. We're going to play one final tune. I want you all to have, a, we're a little somber in here. I feel like we're... we're, we're bringing y'all down. But we're going to make up for that in these days. We want y'all to come to this with the spirit of participation. Have a collegial good time. Approach us and we will be friendly. We hope you enjoy the last song that we're going to play. It's entitled Stable Mates. It's a good song for you to learn because the changes will expose you. And you, you take care and you all have a great time. Thank you.